So once again, good afternoon. Uh, the title of this unit is actually called Atomic and Nuclear Physics. I think on the title page it might just say Atomic Physics. We're dealing with for, I guess, maybe about half the unit, maybe a little bit less than half. We're dealing with the physics of the atom, which is atomic physics. And then we're dealing with the physics of nuclei, which is nuclear physics. We're dealing with, at that point in time, the physics that governs and describes what happens deep down inside of the atom. And that's where we get into things like fission and fusion and radioactive decay and artificial transmutation and a bunch of other things that are more um, deeper in understanding than the outside world like electricity or magnetism. Things are going to be going more and more abstract as we work through this unit. So today what we're looking at is very early atomic models. We're going to be studying something called cathode rays and the, the bulk of today's lesson is about something called J.J. Thompson's charge to mass ratio experiment. So we have a whole laundry list of things we have to do here. Describe the Dalton model of the atom, which is a pretty cheesy model of the atom, but we have to talk about it. Know the properties of cathode rays and basically how the discovery of cathode rays led to the throwing out of the Dalton model of the atom in favor of a better model of the atom, which is called the Thomson model of the atom. And throughout this unit, that is going to be a recurring theme, that we learn about a model of the atom, we study some historical physics that told physicists that that model of the atom was flawed, so we change that model of the atom to a new model of the atom. So we will go from what's called the Dalton model of the atom to the Thomson model of the atom, to the Rutherford model of the atom, to the Bohr model of the atom, and finally to the quantum mechanical model of the atom. It's, it's just as important for you to know why you go from one model of an atom to the next as it is for you to know what the models of the atom are, what they describe. And going from the Dalton model of the atom to the Thomson model of the atom requires us studying the charge to mass ratio experiment. And it turns out that all of the physics we're looking at today is physics you already know, or should already know, okay? It's all going back to electricity and to magnetism. So John Dalton devised the earliest formal model of atomic theory, and it's formal because the idea of matter being composed of atoms is actually an ancient Greek idea. And John Dalton, I want to say early 1800s, maybe, uh, I'm going to say 1800s, I think, I think. And what he proposed was that atoms were indivisible particles. And what this means is if you could take a chunk of, I'll say a chunk of carbon, carbon's pretty brittle in its elemental form, and you put a chunk of carbon on a countertop and you hit it with a hammer to break it into pieces. And then you went looking for the smallest possible piece you had and you brushed off the countertop and you put that smallest piece on the countertop and you smashed it. And then you took the smallest piece of that and you cleared everything away and you kept doing that. He's saying that in theory you would get to a certain point in time where you would have such a tiny, tiny piece of carbon that no matter what you did to it, no matter how heavy that hammer was that you hit it with, it would just ping away. It's indivisible. It cannot be broken into smaller pieces. And I suppose we could get into, at a very basic level, the idea that Dalton believed that carbon atoms were different in some way than, say, gold atoms were. Maybe a different size. Maybe a different force that's kind of holding it into that piece. But it's not important here. It's indivisible. And this is sometimes what you would call the Dalton model of the atom would sometimes be called the billiard ball model of the atom. Do you remember being taught that maybe in junior high and particularly science 10? And that's because an atom, according to Dalton, is like a billiard ball. I mean, I hope you understand that a billiard ball is smashable, right? You could take a billiard ball and if you threw it against a concrete wall hard enough, you'll get pieces of the billiard ball breaking apart. If you hit it with a big enough hammer, you can crush it. Um, by the way, the word atom, I believe, means indivisible in Greek. I think it, it comes from the Greek to mean indivisible. So the important thing to note here is that it's just wrong. 
we, we now know that there are parts that make up an atom, and presumably if an object has parts, then you can take those parts away from each other. So it's, it's, it's an incorrect description of matter. If you hit the atom hard enough, you will break it into smaller pieces, but at least it laid the groundwork. At least it's something that we can improve on, this idea that things are made of atoms. So that's the billiard ball model of the atom. So in the late 1800s, particularly when x-rays were discovered, around the time x-rays were discovered, which was about 1895, people started playing around a lot with creating x-rays. And when you create x-rays, you accelerate electrons to a high speed, and they hit a metal target, and you create x-rays. So they were playing around with high voltages, basically. And they discovered this other stuff, which we call cathode rays. If you apply a voltage, and I'm just using 5,000 volts here as a baseline. It could be 4,000. It could be 12,000. I'm just saying 5,000 volts. And you apply that voltage to, and this is important, to a tube which is nearly evacuated of air. So the, the, the glass tube has some kind of opening in it with a, maybe a plug that you can put in there. You take the plug off, you, you connect that opening to a vacuum pump, and you start pumping out the air, but you don't pump out all of the air. You don't create a pure vacuum in there. It's about 99% evacuated then what you end up seeing in that little bit of air that's there is a greenish glow. And we used to have uh, a demonstration cathode ray tube that I could show students this, but we're not allowed to because it's unsafe. And it turns out it's not unsafe for students, it's unsafe for teachers because the effect that the cathode rays have on the human body is cumulative. So if you're sitting in one or two physics lectures in your lifetime and you're exposed to a cathode ray tube, uh, that's fine. But if I'm going to be doing a demonstration every semester for 30, 35 years, that's not fine. Okay. I think I would be all right. I think the danger is exaggerated with the cathode ray tubes that we would use in high school physics. Anyway, we get this greenish glow. And that's usually called a cathode ray tube. Now, this is the diagram I give you, right? And I thought of trying to get images on there. And there are going to be some images in this unit handout that are in color because we need to see colors to understand certain things. But when I try to print out a good image showing what I want to describe to you, it just doesn't print out well. So I'll show you a couple of pictures in a bit. But you get this greenish glow. One of the things you need to know is that the cathode is the negative terminal. Now, I, <laughs> Chem 30 people, put up your hands. Okay. So w in Chem 30, you have to be careful because which electrode or which side of the cell you name the cathode and the anode depends on whether it's electrochemical or electrolytic. And in an electrochemical cell, which is a battery, it's the positive terminal that's the cathode. I was taught that by Mr. Barrington, my chemistry teacher, because he said cats have paws. Cathodes are positive because cats have paws. He was quite the character. But this is not a battery. This is the opposite. This is what we call an electrolytic cell where you are applying a potential difference or a voltage to a tube or to something in Chem 30, you would apply it to maybe molten aluminum chloride to create something. Okay. But the cathode is the negative terminal, and that's important to know. So this is a picture of a cathode ray tube, and you can see that beam there. And I will tell you right now that the, the beam of light originates from the cathode always. It's why it's called a cathode ray beam. It's a beam of light that originates from the cathode. So what are some properties of these? Well, they would normally travel in a straight line. And if you take a look at this, that beam, which is uh, admittedly it's more blue than green, isn't it? Well, I'll tell you right now that this voltage is probably more than 5,000. And as the voltage goes up, you go from having green colors to more of blue and violet colors because there's more energy involved. So they would normally travel in a straight line, but 
Um, Thompson, who's playing around with these, among other people, is no fool. He decides to try to figure out if they are actually just a beam of light or if they are a beam of particles that's creating light. And this gets a little bit subtle to understand the difference. When I say this is a picture of some cathode rays, that's true. But the cathode rays are not the light. The cathode rays are the beam of particles, it turns out, that make the light. Okay? Cathode rays are no more green or blue light than a banana is yellow light. Right? A banana appears yellow to us, but a banana is not yellow light. It's just something that reflects yellow light. It produces yellow light somehow. Cathode rays are not a beam of EMR. They are a beam of particles with mass that produce EMR somehow. And everything that I'm talking about here is something that we are going to learn about in detail. You will understand by the end of this unit what is happening to produce that light. And you will be able to calculate, based on certain information, the wavelength of the light that's produced in, a, in this type of tube. So what they discovered is they're deflected by electric and magnetic fields. Now, we learned in the previous unit that only charged particles Charged particles with mass are deflected by electric and magnetic fields. And it turns out that if you use the right-hand rule for magnetic fields or for electric fields, you use the idea that opposites attract and similars repel, you discover that these things are deflected in the direction that negative particles would be deflected. What's the conclusion? Cathode rays are consisting of negative particles. And the rays always originated at the cathode. There is a great, and we didn't have one of these here, but I had one at a different school I taught at. This is called a Crookes tube. And there is a cathode here. This is the cathode on this side. And the anode is here. So what's happening is you are attaching a potential difference to the tube like that. And the anode is connected to what's called a Maltese cross. It's just a piece of metal. And when you turn this on and you look at the end of it, you see this image on the right. And what's happening here is the Maltese cross is blocking the cathode rays from hitting the other side. And since the shape of that shadow is exactly the same as the shape of the Maltese cross, those beams of particles must be traveling in straight lines. It's why we know light travels in a straight line. If light was traveling in all kinds of giddy wampus directions, then when you looked up at me, you'd see some kind of weird shape. Okay? Maybe, well, you would see a weirder shape than you're already seeing. All right, so... This is why we call these cathode rays, because they originate at the cathode. That's why they're called cathode rays. So Thompson has figured out that they consist of particles. Now, why is this important? It's because the properties of cathode rays are going to blast a hole right through the concept of Dalton's model of the atom. They're going to obliterate Dalton's model of the atom. Thompson's going to do an experiment. This experiment was done in... 1895-ish, that the conclusion is escapable. Dalton is wrong based on the results of the experiment. And you need to know the results of the experiment, why the results tell you Dalton's model is wrong, and all of the details of the experiment. So this is J.J. Thompson's charge-to-mass ratio experiment. He's a clever fellow and what he wants to know is something about the particles that are in these cathode ray beams. But he's not clever enough to determine the charge on the particles. And he's not clever enough to determine the mass. By the way, as a side note, you remember Millikan who made observations with the photoelectric effect? He comes up with a way to measure the charge on these tiny things, which is pretty amazing. But Thompson is able to come up with a charge-to-mass ratio, and you might wonder why that's important. We're going to save the importance of it to the end. His experiment is typically done in two parts. 
So he's going to determine the charge to mass ratio. What that means is if you take the charge of the particle and divide by its mass, this is the number he's after. Even though he doesn't know either, he's going to figure out the charge to mass ratio. So it's completed in two parts. The first part is to determine how fast these particles are moving. It turns out, and we'll get to this in a bit, if you look at the second part of his experiment, the second part is the main part where he's going to calculate Q over M, but he gets to a point in the second part where he goes, oh, I need to know the speed. So he does part one. You need to know the speed to find the charge to mass ratio in part two. And he has an apparatus. And I've got a small typo here because I reorganize things. His experimental setup was as followed. And the diagram is on the same page. And this diagram that you're looking at lacks technical detail. It's just the schematics of what's going on. And I'll talk about the details of it in a second. If you want to see, um, I believe it's J.J. Thompson's sketch of his own apparatus, you can look on page 755 of your text. But I have it up here. I, I believe this is from his work, from his journals. That he, he made this. You didn't, back then, you didn't just you know, log on to Amazon and order a, a cathode ray tube for scientific purposes. And you didn't have science catalogs you could order from. You had to manufacture this stuff. So you'd blow this glass to the particular shape. While it was still hot in places before this solidified, he put in two plates. Those two plates are an electric field that is the electric field in your diagram with your two plates. Now the diagram I have up here is slightly different than yours only because to change mine to match yours now, I have to change about 40 or 50 diagrams in this file. I think the one on paper you have is better for you to look at, but it's the same thing basically. I'm going to go to something that's even a little more different. Actually, it's pretty close to the same, isn't it? It is the same. The one I'm talking about will be different. It will appear different. But what you notice is there are two parallel plates connected to a potential difference. So there's an electric field. And this is a cathode ray particle. This is one cathode ray particle in that whole beam. And it's going to enter that region. So there is an electric field between those two plates. And those two plates are these two plates labeled D and E. They're connected to a voltage to create an electric field. There's also a voltage here, but this voltage on the left-hand side of this diagram, which is not shown here, is simply the voltage of, say, 5,000 volts that creates the cathode rays. Okay? And there is also a magnetic field. Now, how is the magnetic field created? Well, it's probably created, not probably, it's created with solenoids. These solenoids are quite large. They're actually called helmets coils, if you're interested in researching this kind of thing. But we have two solenoids, and I'm not showing the potential difference that's feeding each of them, that creates a strong magnetic field through the center. So this is the experimental setup. The, the picture on the right, I guess, is probably what I would class as a more modern version that you would buy for teaching and learning purposes, universities would have these. This one on the left is certainly more modern than anything he manufactured, but looking at it, I would say it's an early 70s, late 60s kind of thing that was manufactured back when things were made of wood and not plastic. This is the diagram that's slightly different than yours, but I want you to notice that I still have an electric field, I still have a magnetic field, and I still have a voltage. The only addition to this that you don't have is that red arrow going through the voltage. My potential difference on the other side of the diagram, but who cares? That red arrow means variable. If you want to add it, you can, but it doesn't matter. There's a dial on the power supply that you can increase or decrease the voltage. Are you with me? OK. So what is he going to do with this? He has this cathode ray beam. He has this cathode ray beam that he's going to fire in between these two perpendicular fields. 
So what is the direction of the electric field? And what is the direction of the magnetic field? This is a good review for unit two. An electric field, we're looking at the parallel oppositely charged plates. An electric field direction is the direction of electric force on a positive test charge if you put a positive test charge in the field. Keep in mind the cathode ray beam, he already knows, consists of negative particles. But if we were to put a positive particle in here, it would be repelled from the positive plate and attracted to the negative plate. And that means that the electric field is down. Now, I don't know on your diagram, I, I guess I didn't. I didn't put an electric field and a magnetic field with the notation. You don't have to. I've got them up here, and this is where I'm entering my answers. I'll write them down in a second where you're writing them down. Now, what is the direction of the magnetic field? Well, this is just a matter of knowing the rules that X is out. No, nope, X is in. As soon as I said X is out, I knew I was wrong because O is out. O for out. So the magnetic field here is in. And words mean things. I know you know that. But it's important you understand here that this is the electric field that is down. And this is the magnetic field that is in. Electric is not enough here. It's an electric field. It's a magnetic field. Because now what I'm going to ask is, while those particles are in that region where the two fields are, what is the direction of the forces acting on them? So what is the direction of the electric force acting on the particle? Well, these particles that make up the beam are negative. So you can either just look at the diagram and go, well, a negative particle in terms of electric forces would be repelled from the negative plate and simultaneously attracted to the positive plate, so the electric force would be up. Right? You could just do that. Or you could take a more abstract approach, which is to say that a negative particle is forced in the opposite direction to the electric field. Because electric field direction is where positive particles are forced, negative particles are forced in the opposite direction. Bottom line, Fe is up. Now what about Fm? Well, now we can use a right-hand rule. So we look at this setup. We've got the particles in the beam initially traveling to the right through a magnetic field that is directed in. So if I point the fingers of my right hand into the screen, or if you're at your desk, into the paper, and you simultaneously point the thumb of your right hand to the right, and you say that there are negative particles, so they are forced out of the back of your hand, that's good enough. The magnetic field, which is in, happens to produce a magnetic force, which is down. And I, I hope you understand that in the context of this setup, when we're saying up and down and in and out, we're talking about relative to the paper. We're not saying down towards the surface of the earth. That's not what we're talking about. Well, it is towards the surface of the earth if you're looking at my smart board, right? Down is towards the surface. But that's not what we're talking about on paper. Okay. So... What Thomson did is he adjusted the potential difference between the plates that create the electric field until the beam is not deflected as it passes through those two fields. So don't draw anything here yet for a while. But if this is an individual cathode ray particle, whose charge to mass ratio Thompson wants to determine. And this is the electric force acting on it, and this is the magnetic force acting on it. I think it's quite clear that the electric force wins the battle here. And the, the beam will not be undeflected. It will curve. 
The nice thing about this is you can see the beam, right? Because it, it creates green light. Uh, I didn't show you this at the time. I showed it to you, but I didn't draw your attention to it. If you look at Thompson's apparatus, right in the, I'm going to go back one more, right in the center of this, this is a like a metal cap but it's got a little window, a little rectangular window cut out of it. I don't mean it's made out of glass. It's just a rectangular opening. So the cathode rays, this big smeary beam of light that the cathode rays are producing, hits that and everything ex is stopped except for the green that goes through here. And then it, there's another opening here and it's smaller. The purpose of that is to get a very fine beam of light that you can see. Remember, the cathode rays are not the light, but the light is wherever the cathode rays are. Just like the banana is not yellow light, but if you want to see where the banana is, look for the yellow light. Okay. So this beam of light, we'll go back to here, that's deflected, is easy to see. You can see that it's not, that it's being curved and it's not deflected. And what that means is that the electric force has a magnitude greater than the magnetic force. And here's a quick off-the-cuff series of questions I could ask you about this scenario. And it has nothing to do with Thompson, but everything to do with forces and equations of forces. What are some changes that Thompson could make to the apparatus right now to make the beam less deflected? to try to straighten out the beam. What's one thing, Alex, he could do? He could decrease the voltage between the plates because if you decrease the voltage between the plates, the electric field becomes less, which produces a lower electric force. Could he move the plates further apart? Yes, that would do it, except for the fact that the plates are inside of a piece of glass, right? So I have seen questions like this on diploma exams where they might give you this and you cannot choose that as an answer because you can't do it physically. Is there something else he could do? Well, yeah, he could increase the magnetic field strength somehow. We'll talk about that in a bit. So there are a couple of changes that could be made. What if... At a point in time for a particular setup, this is the electric force and this is the magnetic force. I think it's quite clear that that's going to be what happens. And what does that mean? Well, it means now that the electric force is smaller than the magnetic, or you could say the magnetic force is bigger. What could he do to try to straighten the beam? Well, increase that accel not accelerating voltage, increase the voltage between the plates to get a stronger electric field. Or decrease the magnetic field strength somehow. And by the way, this magnetic force is QVB. The only thing he can do is decrease the magnetic field strength. He can't change the charge of the particle and he can't change the speed because he's trying to find the speed. Right? There are a number of ways you could decrease the magnetic field though. You could use a solenoid with a bigger radius. You could use less current in the solenoid. You could change the thickness of the wire. There are things you could do. Anyway, if this is the case, then that's the imbalance of the forces. For both of these, you're talking about physics principle one where the forces are not balanced. By the way, this arc is not a circle because it's not just magnetic, it's electric as well. We don't study that shape. So what does Millikan, or what does rather Thompson try to do? He tries to balance it. So draw the cathode ray beam on this diagram, undeflected, including the forces. So you're gonna draw a, a, an arrow going directly to the right. You can use a ruler, you can use calculator case cover, steady hand, and hopefully you will know enough that even though when you look back at your notes it doesn't look perfectly straight, you know it is perfectly straight. 
And when we have an individual particle in there, what's important is you have an electric force up and a magnetic force down. Sorry, Erickson. And you weren't here when I said this. This is just the first few pages of the, le of the unit because I haven't had time to photocopy the whole thing. And what's important is you draw those two so they have some semblance of similar size. They should look the same, right? Because they are equal but opposite. And that's it. So this is Thompson's goal. Why? Because believe it or not, this will give him the speed of the particles without knowing anything else about the particles. And in fact, it's a problem, a physics problem, that you should already know how to do. Okay? Because the two forces are equal in magnitude. This is a physics unit two question, physics 30 unit two. So describe the relationship between the electric and magnetic forces and show that the speed can be calculated from the information. Well, the relationship is that the magnitude of the electric force is equal in magnitude to the magnetic force. If I didn't have those absolute value signs, and you can choose to write this down or not. I don't think you need to. If I didn't have them, you would have to write this. which we would never do. You would never analyze it that way. But I'm just pointing out that the two forces themselves are not equal. They are opposite. But the magnitudes are equal. So how do we calculate the magnetic force on a charge moving through a magnetic field? QVB. How do we determine the electric force on a charge in an electric field? Well, there might be a couple of other ways to do it, but primarily it's charge times electric field. Hi, Charlie. I think we're on page two. This is really, nature is kind to Thompson here because the charges cancel, which is kind of a weird idea. It's kind of like we're saying the speed that they're traveling at has nothing to do with the charge. These two charges cancel, and electric field is potential difference between the two plates divided by the distance between the plates. We can find V. I'm not going to rearrange it for V because that's not what the important part of this is. But, but... If you're going to calculate little v, let me highlight it because there's another v there. I guess I can't highlight it. My highlighter has gone MIA. We're trying to solve for this v. That means you need to know everything else in the experiment. So does, does Thompson know the voltage? Well, you know, we're talking late 1800s, but they had voltmeters. And they had some level of electrical technology. So the voltage is measurable between the plates. Can he measure the distance? Well, he manufactured the thing. Surely he knows the distance between the plates. And if he got to, forgot to measure it before he sealed it all up, he can you know, put a ruler there and eyeball it. But the question is, how does he determine the magnetic field? And I'm going to take us back in time to Unit 2. These are from Unit 2 notes. This might even be exact copies of your Unit 2 notes. Please don't copy this down because I'm not going to give you time to. It's in Unit 2 on the lesson on solenoids. We said that when you have a wire carrying a current, there are magnetic field lines surrounding that wire. So those green circles are magnetic field lines. And you use the curly, just what Cyrus is doing there, you use the curly right-hand rule by grabbing the wire with your thumb in the direction of conventional current and your fingers curl around the conductor. What we said is when you create a solenoid, you bend that wire into a loop and the result is a bunch of magnetic field lines in ally with each other, all oriented in the same direction inside, building a strong magnetic field. So this is the magnetic field that Thompson is talking about because he has those big coils of wire surrounding his apparatus. 
I asked you in this lesson, what are three things that determine the strength of the field? And we all agreed on these three. That if you had a greater current, then each electron moving in that wire would have a greater magnetic field around it, and collectively it would be a greater field. Since you get that joining of forces of all of those magnetic fields going in, every time there's a circle of wire, if you had more circles or loops of wire, then you get a stronger magnetic field. And we also said that if you made the turns smaller, then all of those magnetic field lines would get closer to each other in the inside, so the magnetic field would go up. But then I said to you, here's a formula. And I said, you don't need to write it down. And then I remember some of you wrote it down. And I said, I'm giving it to you for two reasons. You might see it on an exam. And then I told you, the main reason is there's something we're going to learn about in Unit 4 that I'm going to say, how did this guy know the magnetic field? The answer is he used this formula. So those helmets coils that I mentioned are those solenoids that are around his apparatus. He knows how many turns of wire there are because unlike, you remember the picture that had those nice perfect solenoids? He did this himself. He took insulated wire and wrapped it around and around and around. He would have manufactured that. So he can count the number of turns. He can measure the current. He knows the radius. And there's a, a constant there that I don't want to get into. But there's a constant in physics. So bottom line is he knows all of those things. Okay, so if he does this experiment and he's calculated the magnetic field to be 1.2 millitesla, using this formula, he's determined this. And using voltage over distance, he's determined the electric field. to be 3.1 times 10 to the 3 newtons per coulomb, what's the speed of the particles? And believe it or not, this was a question on your unit 2 exam. Not the same numbers, and it had nothing to do with Thomson. It just would have maybe said an alpha particle is undeflected through these two fields. How fast is it moving? So you apply the principle of balanced forces. Fm equals Fe in magnitude. QVB equals QE. And we need the decorations around the E because we don't want to confuse it for electric. Uh, we don't want to confuse it for energy. Right? That E is electric field. The charges cancel, and we're left with V equals E over B. I mean, it's that simple. So you need to do for me the following. You need to take the electric field of 3,100 newtons per coulomb and divide by the magnetic field of 1.2 Tesla Is it round to 2.6 or 2.5? 2.6? Okay. So, and the, the last thing I care about here is all of the decimals. That's not what's important. It, you know, it's, it's probably 2.5 something. Yeah. But it's about 2.6 times 10 to the 6. And in the next part of the experiment, when we have another calculation, you, we can feel free to use all the decimals later. Okay? That's it. Okay, so let's look at part two. Part two is where. What he does is he finds the charge to mass ratio. Don't lose sight of the fact that that's the goal of this experiment. What is the charge to mass ratio of these unknown particles? What he does is he observes the cathode ray particle beam when they leave the electric field but are still in a magnetic field. 
And some texts and sources will say, you just turn off the electric field and observe the particles. That works too. But if you look back at his apparatus, and I don't want to click through because it's quite a ways away. If you look back at his apparatus, it's in this region. Actually, I'm going to use this one instead. It's, this whole thing is exposed to a magnetic field. In other words, if you're looking at this diagram, these helmets coils are really big. They, they extend in space to cover this end of the apparatus. But what he did was he left this voltage on between the two plates. So they're undeflected in this region, but then over here they're still exposed to a magnetic field, so they are deflected in a circular arc. By the way, this, this piece of paper that he's glued inside with markings on it, it's so he can measure the amount of curvature. All right, so let's take a look at what happens. Again, this is unit two physics. So if he observes the beam over here where the magnetic field extends, but there's no electric field, we know what's going to happen. It's going to travel in a circular arc because charged particles moving through a perpendicular magnetic field are forced perpendicular to their motion. So they cannot speed up and they cannot slow down. They merely change direction. And this is the textbook kind of description of centripetal motion. And for those of you that were writing an exam and are now coming in, um, I'm recording this, so I'll post a link and you can watch the first part of whatever you missed. So in which direction will the individual particles in the cathode ray beam experience a magnetic force? I say here as an added thing when they first enter, because when they first enter, they're going to be forced in a direction that's going to change. And when the direction of motion changes, the direction of magnetic force changes. We've already answered this question. It's towards the bottom of the page. Right? The magnetic force for this negative particle moving to the right will be down. Why is that magnetic force the net force? Because Fm is the only force. What does it result in? Well, a net force results in acceleration. It accelerates. But it accelerates centripetally. It doesn't accelerate by speeding up or slowing down. It accelerates by changing direction because the force is perpendicular to the motion. And what I'm about to ask you, although I wouldn't have asked you in Unit 2, is something that you learned how to solve in Unit 2. The physics of it you learned how to solve. How can we find the charge to mass ratio? Well, Newton's second law says F net equals MA. But we know that F net is Fm. And if I were to solve this without starting off with F net equals Ma, I would have said this. Fm is the net force. I'm going to ask something here that is being picky, and you don't really need to follow this to complete the lesson. But you understand that since the magnetic force is the only force, it's the net force. Is this true? And before you answer that, I'm asking if that force equals that force. And when we look back at this, I could have asked the same question. Is this statement true? No, it is not, because there are two different forces that are in opposite directions. You need absolute value signs. What I'm asking in this question is, is that statement true? Is Fm equal to F net? The answer is yes, because it's only one force. It's just being described in two ways. Regardless, or as my dad would say, irregardless, we don't need the vector symbols, even though we could include them. 
So we can just write QVB equals MA and say, well, that's a centripetal acceleration. And the work that I'm going to write here, we did before. We did this in unit two a lot of the time. So this becomes QVB equals MV squared over R. One of the V's cancels. And what we would then do, well, not all the time, but what we could do all the time if we wanted to is cross multiply. And then if you wanted to find the radius, you could divide. And if you wanted to find the speed, you could divide by the mass. But here's the kicker. We don't want to find any of those things. We want to find charge divided by mass. So I divide both sides by M. And then I can divide the V by the BR. And now we have a way for Thomson to calculate Q over M. Does Thomson have the skills, do you believe, to measure the radius of the beam that he's looking at? Yes. You probably wouldn't try to measure the radius. It would probably be some geometry formula where you measure how far the arc moves and how much it's displaced vertically. And there's ways mathematically for you to determine it. You could, you know, just take a sheet of paper and, and put it behind and trace that arc and then put the paper down and continue in a circle and find the radius that way. It's not a problem. Does Thompson know the magnetic field strength? Yes. How? Counted the number of turns, measured the current, measured the radius of the coils. Wait, a, hang on. How, does Thompson know the speed? Yeah, that's part one, right? That's what I mean by he probably thought of, I don't know. I haven't read a lot of history on this. He probably thought of this experiment and went, geez, you know, I could do this to find the charge to mass ratio if only I knew the speed. And then he said, well, what if I put plates in there? So... That's how you would do it. I've mentioned this before. I just mentioned it this morning in my Physics 20 class. Students who are more successful in high school physics are not the ones who are going to memorize formulas. They are the ones who understand how to go from the principle of net unbalanced force causing circular motion to Q over M equals V over BR. Now, you can't help it. Sooner or later, many of you will memorize Q over M equals V over BR. But don't set out to memorize it. So now the final question before we tie this all together, just curious what I have here, no, is when the electric field is removed or when we look at the beam when it's traveling only in the magnetic field, when it reaches the ends of the plates, let's say he measures the radius to be 1.34 centimeters. In which case, what is he going to get for V over BR? Listen, I know we just did this, but... I'm not going to show the individual steps to go from there to Q over M equals V over BR because I think that's just a rearranging mathematically of the equation. So we're just going to take that speed. I'll put in the numbers 258333.3 repeating meters per second divided by the magnetic field of 1.2 times 10 to the negative 3 Tesla, and also divided by the radius of 1.34 times 10 to the negative 2 meters. And this is going to be the charge to mass ratio of the particles, of these mysterious particles that are creating the green light. One point seven six times ten to the eleven. 
Yes? Okay. And I know that, not because I did the calculation, but because I know that's the charge to mass ratio of cathode ray particles. And I, I was pretty sure that I designed a question here that would give us the proper results. Don't forget when you divide that speed by this and this to either put them in brackets and multiply in brackets or do what I do, which is to go divided by, divided by. So while I've been talking, most of you have had an opportunity to calculate it. Am I correct in saying you're getting Q over M equals 1.76? Is it 1.76 you get? One point six? Okay. What would the units be? Well they would be coulombs per kilogram. So in reality it's one point seven six. Okay. So what? I started off by telling you that this experiment is going to blow a hole through the Dalton model of the atom, through Dalton's idea that atoms are indivisible. Why is it? First of all, I guess I believe it's just important that you know the conclusion is Dalton is wrong. But I, I feel the need to, at this level, you guys are smart, to walk you through why that's the case. So it turns out that this is the value that you would get if you repeated the experiment a number of times if you repeated the experiment a number of times and refined your procedure, that's what you would get. Now it turns out, and there's a hole in this logic, but at this level I want to explain it to you, but I can't explain it in too much detail because it wouldn't make sense. So there's a slight hole in this logic, and if you tend to stumble upon it, we can talk about it individually. It turns out that that value is about 1,800 times larger than the charge-to-mass ratio of hydrogen. I'm sure you're aware John Dalton did a lot of work with the periodic table. We understood, even though his concept of what an atom was, was wrong, we understood that hydrogen atoms were different than helium, different than lithium, beryllium, etc. And hydrogen atoms are the smallest atom. Okay? They knew that. Their periodic table maybe didn't have 106 or 112 or however many we have now but they knew hydrogen was number one. There are two possibilities here. One, well let me write them out for you, is that Q to M of these mysterious particles is so much bigger than Q to M ratio of hydrogen. There's only two explanations. One is that the charge of the cathode ray particles is so much bigger. And based on the observations of how the beams are deflected in fields, it became very apparent that that couldn't be the case. There's no way these invisible particles have a charge that's so much greater. It's just not possible based on the observations. What that means, the only other explanation is that the mass of these particles is so much smaller. But think about what that is saying. There are particles in this beam whose mass are smaller than the smallest atom of hydrogen. If everything is made of atoms, and atoms are indivisible, how on earth do you get a, a particle that's smaller than an atom? And the answer is, you can't, unless the atoms are divisible. Every time I teach this lesson, I'm very careful not to let slip a piece of information. What are cathode ray particles? They're electrons. Thompson is the person who is credited with discovering electrons. These tiny negative particles whose mass is very, very tiny compared to hydrogen, about one eighteen hundredth. This is what an electron is. It's a part of an atom that's smaller than the smallest atom. So what does it tell you about Dalton's model? It's wrong. Dalton's model is incorrect. 
you know, if Dalton really was stubborn, he would look at the results of Thompson and say, well, no, you're wrong because atoms are indivisible. And you just said you've discovered something smaller than an atom. You can't have something smaller than an atom unless it's a part of an atom. And we call these particles electrons. And that means that this old model of the atom, the Dalton model of the atom, which is sometimes called the billiard ball model, sometimes called the hard sphere model, is replaced with something like this. This is the best Thompson can come up with. He does know atoms are neutral. They don't carry electric charge. But they have parts that are negative, and these parts are very tiny. These electrons are very, very tiny in mass. And he envisions that in order to get a neutral atom, you have this sphere of what he called a positive fluid, like a jelly-like substance. It's kind of a weird notion. And in swimming around in that substance are electrons. Like plum pudding. Now, until I took physics, I always thought pudding was like, you know, goopy pudding. But this is a, an example of a Christmas pudding that you would see overseas in England. And what it is is you, you, you make a dough. It's almost like a cake, but it's a very sweet dough. And you put in it plums or raisins or whatever you want, and you mix it up. It's a very thick dough. And then you wrap it into a ball surrounded by foil, and you either bake it or boil it. And the, at first, the notion of it is kind of like, Ew, it's delicious. And there's some custard on top with Looks like, I don't know what that is, cranberries. Ugh. Anyway, I used to call this one on the right the chocolate chip cookie model. And then a student corrected me one year and said, a chocolate chip cookie's flat, Mr. Way. This is a sphere. So I can call it the chocolate chip cookie dough ball model. When you're making cookies and you, you get a ball of cookie dough and then you put it in your mouth and eat it, that's what the Thompson model is like. So a lot covered here today. Not a lot of calculation stuff for new physics, but it's an incredibly important application of physics. Does anybody have any comments or questions? And if we think that the Thomson model is an accurate description of what an atom looks like, we're wrong. It's going to be improved. And every time we improve it, it will be because some new physics thing has been discovered that we kind of can understand because I've taught you the material already. Something new has been discovered and you go, oh, wow, this is wrong. And that's what we're going to deal with on Monday. We're going to start poking holes literally in this model of the atom. What's happening here in Thompson's experiment is you have that middle part where he determines the speed, and then you have this other part where you can determine the charge to mass ratio. Why couldn't Thompson determine the speed by using this set of formulas on the left? Why couldn't he just measure the voltage that's being applied to the cathode ray tube and use voltage equals change in energy of the particles over charge? Why couldn't he do that? didn't know the charge or the mass. But you, we, are smarter than him in terms of our knowledge base. We really are. We have a far broader volume of knowledge in our heads than Thompson did. So you are allowed to use this anytime you want. As, as soon as you see cathode ray particle, it's electron. As soon as you see photoelectron, it's electron. So uh, there's Thompson... Practice problems are dealing with applying electric and magnetic forces and fields to charged particles and maybe finding you know, charge to mass ratios. A lot of this is just extra practice from unit two.